G'day guys, welcome back to the finals edition of the Football Come Down. Very uh, interesting first week of finals for sure. We've got a whole stack of comments to unpack from this weekend's games. And as usual, I'll sort of let the comments sort of dictate the flow of the conversation, but there's a lot of different angles here. And uh, we'll start with some general comments, I suppose. We've got Brandon Cavallaro saying, worst possible results, the Swans, Geelong, and the Hawks winning. Uh, those are three of the probably the more successful teams of the AFL era, so I think I get what you mean by that. Angus Healy says, for a season that has been so even, the first round of finals wasn't. And Luca Caldi says, the first week of finals has been horrible to say the least. One good game and three cap one, uh, crap ones. I have to say that you're right, like in the sense that none of the games were, or well, there was one close game game and uh, three sort of blowouts or at least games that didn't feel like it was a really good contest for much of it. I still found it quite entertaining. I think there were so many interesting narratives from this weekend. Uh, in particular, I think the first qualifying final between Geelong and Port Adelaide is just absurd. Like it's a fascinating result. So from that sense, I still found it entertaining. Um, even though it completely blew apart my finals prediction. Um, insane stuff. And then also there's some fascination around Hawthorne, even though they won fairly comfortably. It's still a fascinating narrative. David Evening also says one good contest from four finals disappointing. Jai1995 says Brisbane or GWS to make the grand final. That's a pretty big call, seeing both of them are playing each other in a semi-final this weekend, and then the winner has to play Geelong at the MCG. But... Could happen, could happen. Jaden went four out of four in tipping. Well done. I got the Port Adelaide one wrong. Uh, Yusuf K says, fair play to Chris Scott on getting Geelong to where they are and Flag Hawk is real. Yeah, we've got some more comments on, on both of those topics as we get through the games, but Chris Scott is an unbelievable coach. Uh, Cockmuncher says, Giants choked. Bulldogs were ordinary. Port and Carlton didn't even show up. Yeah, we definitely had all four losers this week will be kicking themselves um, you know, the three of them were pretty off in the sense that, you know, Carlton had that horrendous start to the game. The Bulldogs, I think, performed way below what they should have expected. And then there's Port Adelaide. And the Giants, at least, you know, they got in themselves into a winning position and will be gutted to let it slip in the way they did. Tiger Walker says, Lions flexed their muscles in the first half, but inaccuracy turned the game from an easy 60-point win to a pretty tw uh, boring 28-point win. The Giants choked, which is really rare for them, and Port and the Dogs were ordinary. As I said, we'll get into more detail as this goes on, but I think the Lions um, sort of coasting in that game is not something that I think is going to be a real concern for them. They still got 60 points up. You can understand why they dropped off. Diesel Power says Geelong and Sydney or Hawthorne Grand Final. It's interesting. Well, again, we'll get into this, but we seem to have universally discounted Port Adelaide from being a chance at a home game against Hawthorne this week. So we'll see what happens there, absolutely. And I do understand it, but I think your prediction there is, is fairly solid. Imagine we get a Geelong Hawthorne Grand Final. Who would have seen that coming? Uh, the Quarters Footy had a bunch of comments. Sydney never gave up attitude to beat GWS. Makes it harder for GWS. We know the Giants don't mind travelling. Can they potentially, if they even beat Brisbane, beat Geelong at the MCG? I think they could. I think they could. Geelong teaching Port Adelaide a mega lesson. Hawthorne wings are only getting bigger. Bulldogs' low days are coming. Carlton's loss is vindication of Frio supporters. Mm, yes, sort of. I mean, yeah, it is. But at the end of the day, Fremantle still couldn't clinch eighth spot when they had plenty of opportunities in that final month. And they did also lose to Carlton this year. So I get your point, though. It's very easy to make the argument that Fremantle would have played better, and I think they would have. The Brisbane Lions are roaring, Carl Quarters Footy also says. All right, we'll crack into the actual games themselves individually. So it started with... Port Adelaide versus Geelong. This this was an absurd result, uh, particularly the margin. You know, I think looking at the games this weekend, you know, in isolation, I thought that this one was probably the one that had the least fascination going into the game. I think all of the others, um, you know, I was intrigued by how Carlton would come out. I really thought Carlton would play better than they did. Uh, the Bulldogs versus Hawthorne, I thought was going to be much closer. Sydney GWS was always going to be a really good game. And so therefore Geelong and Port Adelaide, I thought it was likely that Port Adelaide were going to win, but if Geelong had won, I probably wouldn't have been that stunned. So that's what I mean by that. And yet, and yet this result has turned out to be the most head scratching all of all of them so far. 84 points Port Adelaide lost by at home. This continues an alarming trend of finals in recent times. And we'll get to the comments. There's uh, somebody actually makes that point, but you know, go back to 2021, the 71 point loss at home in a prelim. Uh, what did they lose to GWS last year in the semi-final? I think it was only about five goals in the end or four goals, but it was an ugly loss. It was a really ugly loss. 
and now 84 points in a home qualifying final in a game where they, I don't didn't check the odds, but I thought they would have been favourites for sure. I think this is becoming a body of work that is it can no longer be ignored as an outlier. This is becoming seriously a problem for Port Adelaide to be uncompetitive in home finals. It's uh, I don't know how to diagnose exactly what's going on there. You have to think it's mentality. But I remember watching the game and it started well enough. I think the power in front early in the second quarter. And then Geelong kicked 16 goals to two after that. It's absurd. So I don't know where you know you start and finish with this and to what extent is this Geelong being amazing and to what extent is it Port Adelaide being awful, or at least it was an awful performance. We know that Port Adelaide as a team are not awful. I remember thinking after they beat Fremantle in Perth, I was so confident that we would see a more mature and evolved version of Port Adelaide this final series, and they have stunned me with this performance. Um, Geelong as well, with Tom Stewart ill, you know, I, we would have thought one of their most important players, and he misses and it doesn't even, they don't even bat an eyelid. I did laugh, I was watching some analysis from this game um, on David King, and he said, in the last five years, that was Geelong's best scores from clearance game in five seasons, and then he added, if you take away their games against West Coast. And I was like, God damn it. There's so many good individuals from this game. It's hard to isolate. I thought Max Holmes' run from the center was outstanding. You know, he's had a great year. He's a genuine gun now. Patrick Dangerfield as well. Again, I I remember thinking at the start of the year, a 34-year-old Dangerfield is still a good player, but not going to have a massive impact on where they are as a team. But that has absolutely been proven false this year. There's a huge correlation between Dangerfield playing well and Geelong playing well. And he was fantastic again in this game. I think he had like eight clearances, but they still would have won without him. So it's just a remarkable effort. We'll go through the comments. Sonia says, Port suck. Fair. Max Hansen says, Port Adelaide's last four finals is the worst four final stretch in VFL AFL history. 0-4 with a percentage of 51.9%. Now that... That made my point better than I could have when you spell it out like that. He credits useless AFL stats. So in 21, they lost by 71. In 23, they lost by 48 to then lose by four goals at home to the Giants. And then this this week, obviously, 84 points to Geelong. You can't really, in my opinion, draw any link between the 07 grand final and this current Port Adelaide group, it just, it's so far removed. I think it's a playing group issue, but it is a serious problem now. It is a serious problem now. Shadowlight says, by far the most boring finals game I've seen to date with Port, not just capitulating more and more as the game went on, but the R spirit and dignity, ah, the ASD, literally fell out of the back of them. Geelong utterly embarrassed them at home and Josh Carr will want out and who knows, West Coast could come calling for either Carr or Hinckley. Jezza is an absolute beast. Hmm, yeah, not the biggest uh, advertisement for getting Hinkley or Carr as our senior coach. Um, we'll see. Uh, it's so much remains to be played out. It, it sounds like West Coast are going hard at Stephen King. We'll see. Ballistic says straight set support again. Yeah, yeah, they're coming up against one of the stronger bottom of the eights teams we've had in a long time. Obviously, you, you think back to the Bulldogs in 16 and GWS made a grand final from sixth in 19. But this is not a normal year where the seventh placed Hawks who didn't even host week one of the finals, are one of the better teams in the comp. I mean, we're starting to narrow it down where all the good teams are left, but everyone seems to have written off Port Adelaide, and perhaps rightfully so. Ethan New says, Cats are back in 2022 form. That is the most impressive Geelong performance um, I have seen, obviously, since their premiership. They had a really down year last year, but even just looking at this year in isolation, I have not seen Geelong wow me like that in some time they were dominant. How many shots of goal do they have? I think it was in the high 30s in the end. I can't remember exactly, but it was just ridiculous. And I actually posted a poll. I was like, does this now make Geelong premiership favorites? Because they now host a prelim at the MCG and technically not an MCG tenant, but they're still pretty good at the MCG and have no real concerns. There are no more travel. Um, Whatever grand final they play, unless it's Hawthorne, is gonna be a home game now. They are a serious chance of winning their second premiership in three years, and it, I just did not see that coming. Fair play to Geelong, and we got more comments on Chris Scott. We'll get to that. Spin Doctor has a couple of comments. Well, you could run out of words to describe how bad Paul were. 
Every year, people overrate the performances of the winners of the two elimination finals and put too much emphasis on the losers of the qualifying finals. Spinney here is a Hawks fan as well, so you know he's not being biased here. In the second week of the finals, there is an overwhelming trend of the teams that lose the qualifying finals, turning it around in week two. You don't finish second on the home and away ladder by playing consecutive terrible games too often. The Hawks will need to be at their best to take down Port. It's a 50-50 game despite what the odds are suggesting. Yeah, it's a, it's. I, I agree with your point. Too often we extrapolate the week one performance. This one was so bad though that I am a little bit concerned for Port Adelaide's ability to dust themselves off and win a semi-final. To what extent is us all dropping off Port Adelaide justified? I think it's fairly justified. I I think I'm going to tip Hawthorne this week. I think you'd be a brave man not to, but I understand as a Hawks fan, you're not getting ahead of yourself. Spin Doctor says, the on-again, off-again love that Port fans have for Ken Hinckley is amazing. I can't remember anyone calling for the coach's head in the middle of a finals campaign before. <laughs> Agreed. And and no one's no one should ever sack their coach in the middle of a finals uh, series. That's just asking for trouble. But I understand the frustration, absolutely. And I, I, I do wonder, and I put it to you guys to potentially let me know, has it been a more disappointing week one finals performance ever, considering Port Adelaide finished second and, and were the home team in this game to lose by... They nearly lost by as much as West Coast did at GMHBA in the final round. And that that tells you a lot, doesn't it? It was only nine points less. Ray says, Chris Scott is the best coach of the 21st century. He might not be the greatest, in brackets Clarkson, but on pure ability to get out of his team more than anyone else could. For 14 straight years is something that is almost impossible to replicate. Jaden says, Chris Scott is a top three coach this century. Yeah, I would agree with that. I'm trying to think who were the best coaches of this era. Um, you've got... Uh, Bomber Thompson comes to mind, obviously what he did at Geelong previously, Alistair Clarkson's an obvious one, Damian Hardwick is another really obvious one, Mick Malthouse as well probably deserves some credit, although didn't have the premierships that the others did. I think he's got to firmly lodge himself into this conversation, if he wasn't already. But when you consider as well, I remember when Chris Scott took over at Geelong, there was this narrative of, well, anyone could have coached them and they would have won the premiership in his first season. Uh, fair enough at the time. That's a fair observation given how good Geelong were in 2011. But you just look at the body of work since and there's been so much outside doubt about Geelong. And, and to be fair, that's based on how teams normally go after a premiership window. What Geelong have done has been a massive outlier. They've been tactically sound the entire time under Chris Scott. I've done a whole video on this as well. They have regenerated their list and they've got some star talent. But I think what makes a good coach and what is a really good sign is when you get players who are no namers and drafted late and SSP picks that come in and play well in a system. Obviously, there's a bit of good recruiting in that, but there's also a strong suggestion that the system and the ability to motivate your players is really good at Geelong. And I've made a video of how Hawthorne are doing similarly right now with Sam Mitchell. But I think even just the motivation part and how consistent Geelong have been over a period of time. Of course, last year was a down year through some injury, but I don't know if I've ever rated their list as being, you know, potentially there on grand final day this year, but they've proven me wrong. Musy Cats King says, in round 24, your Eagles kicked 21 more points than, against us than Port. That makes West Coast a 21 point better side than Port Adelaide. Uh, yeah, that just speaks to how bad this performance was. Um, obviously, you know, we'll ignore the fact that Port Adelaide beat us by 50 points this year. Let's move on to the Bulldogs and Hawthorne. That was a massive chunk of this episode, but we'll, we'll talk about the Hawks who started the year 0-5. They were then 1-6 and and have come from the clouds. What are they won? 15 of their last 19 now, if you include that finals performance. And, you know, overcame a bit of a slow start and were pretty much untroubled for the rest of the game. We saw Lloyd Meek absolutely get one over on Tim English um, for a guy that was unable to get an opportunity at Fremantle for him to do that. It's not a really a massive surprise, to be honest, but it's just... Another part of this large narrative and these young Hawks continue to impress us. You know, there's so many different ways they can hurt you. They're good in the contest. They're good on the outside. They've, they've got good runners. They've got a really damaging forward line. In, in this game, you know, it was Cole Shadir and Nick Watson, a couple of 18 or 19 year olds doing most of the damage. James Sicily was also fantastic in this game. You know, they, they played a pretty tall forward line, the Bulldogs, but Sicily was unreal. You know, you just look at some interesting stats here. The Dogs a top three uh, for both disposals and contested ball. They got smashed in these stats, in this game in particular. They were the best inside 50 differential team, I think. They lost it by 20 in this game. And there's been a lot said of Bonds and Pelly playing forward in the third quarter. I can sort of understand why they'd want to give, them, give themselves a spark up forward, but when you're losing the ball out of the center, like they were, 
it's a very questionable decision. And I think he, you know, spent some time on the bench in that third term as well. Seems like he was fully fit. Yeah, Beveridge will come under fire for that if he hasn't already. Let's get straight to the comments, there's heaps. S10 says, Hawthorne are entering another dynasty under Sam Mitchell because of the list build. I think we should hold our horses on that. I think you need to, what is a dynasty? I think it's an extended period of time where you probably need to win multiple flags over that period to do that, and they haven't won one yet. So we'll, we'll see, I won't join you on that, but I can understand the optimism, of course. They are so good and so young and are gonna get better in the off season. Play on footy says, Hawkball sizzles. Shadow Light says, what game to really kickstart finals off between the Hawks and the Dogs? The Hawks are now the genuine dark horse to finals, and boy, did they look it by halftime onwards. Hawks having every answer to the retaliation by the Dogs, absolutely. Canville says, Hawks are a serious threat. Be beating the Bulldogs by 37 points or something is crazy. We're very Hawks heavy so far with the comments. We will get to some Bulldogs ones as well. Real Swift said, Sydney could be caught napping by the Hawks while the Cats could go on to win it all. Interesting, yeah, they've still got Port Adelaide to get through, but you, you just can't write off this Hawthorne team and, and certainly agreed on the Cats too. Jaden says, if you did a 2023 redraft, Nick Watson would be number two and Corsha Deer would be top 10. Interesting, I think... Uh, if we want to answer this like quite literally, I think if you did the redraft, I probably still don't think he would go pick two. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not at all suggesting that he's not an unbelievable small forward and what he's done this year is fantastic. But you do need to take in, into context a couple of things. First of all, he's playing in a fantastic team. And as the team's gotten better, he's gotten better. And there's a lot of other prospects in that draft who didn't get the same opportunity Nick Watson did. Not suggesting he's a front runner. All 18-year-olds, except for maybe Harley Reid this year, and a few others like Harry Shears or Nick Dacos. Okay, there's, there's quite a few. But to some extent, all of these kids rely on what's going on around them to help them perform. And I think Nick Watson would probably go around the same mark because I still think... Someone like a Zane Dersma, for instance, we are years away from seeing the best of him. I will do a redraft and, and maybe he would go big too, but I, I'm hesitant to agree on that. Cole Shadir though, my God, again, one of the last picks of the draft, I think, if not the last, as a father son to Hawthorne, my God, he has exceeded expectations this year. He's, since he's come into the team, they've barely lost, probably a little bit of a coincidence, but his output has far exceeded what should be reasonably expected of him. And Riley Burke agrees when he says, Cole Shadir is going to be an absolute superstar. Spin Doctor says, the Hawks getting half of their goals from first few players exemplifies the evenness of this team. It would not be a surprise if Gunston and Bruce has combined for seven with their finals experience, but for Dia and Watson to stand up and not just contribute, but to dominate the forward line is great for them personally, but even better for the team as a whole. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, a sign of a good team is when some of your more obvious players, in this case, avenues to goal, are down, the other ones step up. And Kulsha Deer to do do what he's doing as um, as a key position player in his first year. That's taken me more by surprise than Nick Watson as such. Spin Doctor says John Newcomb is built for finals. Yes, uh, a, a contender for the Garriers medal. There's also he need to consider, but. He had 30 touches to the three-quarter time. I, don't, I can't remember what he ended up on. Studi is my dad, says Hawthorne will win the flag if they can get through this week and find a way to overcome GWS and Geelong, who have both found ways this season to close off their midfield threat. That's true in the sense that GWS and Geelong have both beaten Hawthorne recently to probably two of the only four teams that have done that since about, I don't know, God knows, round seven. You are discounting Sydney there, who I think also beat Hawthorne heavily this year. That's that's about round four or five, I reckon, though. So we're fa fairly removed from that. And finally, we've got a couple on the Bulldogs here. Jaden says, Bevo is not the right man to coach the Dogs. The list should be grand final quality. Bont in the forward line, on the bench for 12 minutes in the third quarter while Hawks are storming on. Come on, Bevo. Losing week one is unacceptable for such a quality side. I agree to an extent. I agree that you can criticize the specific decision for Bontempelli to be playing forward in that third quarter, and you've got to live and die by your decisions, Bevo, and he... Well, I think that's an obvious question mark, that particular one, and there's also been selection question marks throughout the year. Um, as for them performing to expectation, I think we'll wait and see exactly how deep Hawthorne get, because they were unlucky in a sense to host a elimination final against one of the hottest teams in the competition. That doesn't happen very often. That being said, I think they'll be very disappointed they didn't get closer. I thought that they certainly had the capacity to. There were times this year where the Bulldogs were one of the best teams in the comp on that current form for a pretty extended period there. Sort of like the last third of the season, they were pretty damn good. Is their list premiership ready? I don't think it is. I, I did a video on this earlier this year and I think there's a lot of guys about to pop and I think the next few years will be really interesting I think you, you see some of their best talents like Darcy and 
even Norton is only 25 and Jamara really step up and you know they, they've done a pretty good job of kind of refreshing their list over the years without actually having to dip into you know the bottom four or anything like that some of that is a little bit of luck like Jamara was an NGA of course Sam Darcy one of their best young talents a father son there's a little bit of luck with that involved as well but I still think they're a couple years off they have every right to be disappointed with their elimination final loss and I think from memory a sloppy start to the season might have cost them a higher position on the ladder but you know that's true of Hawthorne too Brooklyn says the Bulldogs faltering at the first week of finals yet again five of seven times in 10 years I didn't quite realize that that's a fair observation a fair criticism um, again you know in terms of their list position I think they're they're ready to pop I think losing Bailey Smith will be a blow but they do have a lot of good young talent there um, you know two first round draft picks last year that we haven't seen a whole lot of in Sanders and Jordan Croft but we've also seen them being unbelievable in finals obviously 2016 pretty different list now looking back at it and in 2021 they were unbelievable in finals as well but uh, yeah that's an interesting stat next we have the Sydney Derby final and this uh, this one absolutely lived up this was clearly the best game of the entire weekend with Sydney getting down by I think 27 points in the second or third term I think it was a third and they came back to win and it was a very gutsy performance and you know I like both teams and I wanted them both to win I didn't want either team to lose and yet I, I find myself pleased that Sydney have been able to correct you know the, the malaise that we saw and that's being generous malaise is a very soft word for what we saw from Sydney for a while there for them to correct that and book themselves a home prelim I'm kind of glad that they're able to capitalize somewhat on the position that they were in, you know, finishing top of the ladder. We'll give some love to Isaac Heaney here. Uh, again, I'm also pleased about this to see him deliver in finals. I think his form dipped for a bit there as the team dipped, but I love seeing the best players play well in finals and that's what we got. So I talked about Newcomb as being a, a contender for the Gary Ayres medal. That's the best performed player in finals. It really depends how deep either of these teams go, but they might play each other in a prelim, Sydney and Hawthorne. Isaac Heaney has probably made a great start and collected probably the full votes, if that was if that's even a thing. But yeah, 30 disposals, 18 contested, three goals and seven clearances. It's probably one of the best finals performances in some time. Uh, we got, we'll go straight to the comments on this one. Ozates says the Sydney Swans are the real deal. It's funny that we need to say that for a team that finished top of the ladder, but I kind of get it when you consider how hard they fell away there. That performance against Port Adelaide lost by 112 points. And then Port Adelaide, not that long later, lose by 84 points to Geelong and Sydney beat Geelong this year. What a weird season. But they probably have reaffirmed themselves as a genuine premiership contender. And again, it sounds odd because they clinched the minor premiership, but such was their drop off. Biggie Steve says Heaney isn't from this world. Again, it's fantastic to see him at full flight. And there, there is a correlation between Heaney in his best form and Sydney playing well. Um, you know, over the years, like 2022, Heaney had an outstanding season. He didn't have a great year last year, nor did Sydney by their lofty standards. Now he's back at the top of his game. Sydney are playing well, so you're happy to see it. G-Bag says, mark of the year and goal of the year should include finals as well. Heaney's mark and Jez's first goal were miles above any of the finalists for the award this year. I think that's a great call. I don't really see a real reason why we shouldn't include finals for mark and goal of the year. You can understand with something like the Brownlow, like uh, or all Australian, that would be unfair to include finals, but for something that's a little bit, tr not trivial, but a little bit more of a relaxed award where it's not a whole heap of prestige around winning it, that you don't need to have everyone play the exact same amount of games or anything like that. I would agree, Heaney's mark, Bobby Hill's mark was also pretty damn good though. And But Jeremy Cameron's goal as well probably would have won goal of the year, to be honest. G-Bags points out that Heaney is a massive favorite for the Gary Ayers medal. I agree with you. I sort of touched on that myself, but you'd have to think that if Sydney go, well, I suppose if Sydney lose a prelim, he would have only played two finals. But we are only one game in. We are only one game in, so I'm not too sure about Newcomb necessarily doing it four times. In general, I agree with you. Mark8860 says, Sydney rely on their stars to carry them, and if teams can put them away with better accuracy, which the Gi Giants fail to do, then they're gettable. I suppose that is true. Sydney have had this little trend of starting games poorly and coming back to win, and this was another example. They've come from behind like five or six times this year. I think they did it against Geelong, they did it against Adelaide, certainly did it in this game, and there are more examples than that. Well, I think they did it against West Coast, actually. I think it was... I think we were at like 15 points up at halftime. That's weird to say, isn't it? Some dude says Swans can't finish off with a lead in the first half of a game. GWS is still very strong, and if they can play as well as they did against the Swans for all four quarters, they could win the flag. Informed Geelong could be the scariest threat. Uh, yes, I agree with you in that the Giants have a, a pretty proven ability to play well at the MCG. So 
um, you know, I think if you can get five goals up against Sydney, you could certainly beat them in grand final day at the MCG. Again, they're a little bit unlucky that, you know, Port Adelaide lost because playing Geelong at the MCG, I think, is actually a tougher challenge than playing Port Adelaide at that ground where they beat them there last year. But I do agree that the Giants are a serious premiership contender and, again, a proven ability to show up in finals regardless of the venue. So don't sleep on them. In fact, play on footy agrees. Don't sleep on the Giants. I agree with you. Shadow Light says, honestly, look like a one-sided affair at the Battle of the Bridge. Then the Swans hit the Giants with a steel chair out of nowhere with genuine fightbacks twice. That's a good point. I think it was like, I mentioned the 27-point deficit, but there were a couple of goals down with like eight minutes to go, maybe less. I think when Ward kicked that goal, it, it looked like the Giants might have clinched it. But as you say, a very clutch win by the Swans. He, he says, GWS Sydney Grand Final, please, for the love of God, make it happen. And Icebreaker says, I have a feeling we could get an all Sydney Grand Final. Yeah, well, again, I keep mentioning it, but I predicted that at the start of the year. And yes, I may have changed that at the start of the finals, but you can bet your ass if GWS play Sydney in a grand final, I am going to clip the shit out of the prediction I made at the start of the year. My God, Port Adelaide made me look silly. And the last game of week one of the finals um, was probably not as interesting, but the comments are interesting. We'll, we'll get to those, of course, but Brisbane opening up a uh, 10 goal lead before Carlton scored. Um, I've got it here. What was it? The first time that's happened. So the Blues have uh, scoreless through the first term. They're the first side since North Melbourne in 1974 to have 0-0 next to its name at quarter time in a final. And the score was 60-0. to Man, that's so disappointing. <laughs> I really thought with Carlton's renewed you know, energy after a week off and, and potentially some players back, we might see a different version of them. Again, I think back to the Bulldogs in 16. I think they had a number of injuries in the final game uh, against Fremantle. They lost at Subiaco Oval or whatever it was called then. Then they went back to that same ground with some players back to play a better team in West Coast in an elimination final and absolutely walloped them. Now, I didn't think Carlton was going to win, but I thought we might see a different version of Carlton. But unfortunately... What emerged was the team that really fell away towards the back end of the year with some really disappointing performances. Injuries are probably a big mitigating factor this year, but they were quite poor and probably should have played better, as I'm sure their fans would agree. Not too many takeaways from this game. The more fancied home team that is battle-hardened and beat Carlton in a final last year flexed some muscle. They got 60 points up. They kicked first nine goals. Carlton then kicked the next five and were able to mitigate the damage somewhat. I thought Will Ashcroft played really well through the midfield. And I thought Cam Rayner continues to show this ability to step up in, in big games. I think he's a nice little wild card for them. But we already know this about Brisbane. The only other concern for them, I think Jack Payne has a suspected knee injury. Again, by the time this comes out, I don't know if you'll have more information about that than me, but hopefully he's okay. So we'll move straight to the comments of this game. And I was surprised by the some of the tone of them. We'll get to that. Zelmazam says, Freo would have put on a better show in Brisbane. Only good game this weekend was the guys in Sydney. Uh, yeah, it's hard to argue with that. I think Fremantle also do play okay at the Gabba. Um, again, going off the top of the noggin there, but I felt like even when Free Wantle were sort of still towards the bottom of the ladder, they used to play well at the Gabba against Brisbane. I think it's hard to argue that they wouldn't have gone better than 60 to zip. AFL Snap says, Carlton being down 60 to zero and being four minutes away from a 121 year record. I presume that's being 0-0 at half time. I can't remember exactly when they scored their first goal. Uh, but that would make sense. That would have been insane. Carlton's run of form there towards the back end of the year, like in particular that Hawthorne loss and now this. I just hate that it's what's sandwiched in between all those results is them belting West Coast at the Stadium. <sighs> Shadow Light says, a valiant fight back in the second half by the Blues, and that's the only good thing to be said of them as the Lions completely nuked the Blues at every turn. The damage was done by halftime, and the Lions comfortably cruised to the semifinals after halftime in low-range gear. Carlton and the Dogs out straight away leaves a lot to be desired for their fans. Carlton more than ever, since there was the expectation to finish top two by the club and fans. Perhaps this list is, in fact, nothing past their big stars. It's a little bit hard to diagnose exactly how Carlton fell away. I think, I think you know, even their fans are a little bit nonplussed. I still think there is a very good team in there, and certainly there probably is a disparity between what their best players produce and consistency of role players. And that's what you see, you know, sort of at odds with teams like Geelong and Hawthorne is you look at a stat sheet and it may not be that their top contributors are, you know, that far and away and dominating, but what the rest of their team are doing in terms of contributing to their role is ultimately the difference between them and some of these other teams. And with Carlton, that's probably the case. You know, they've probably relied on, you know, their stars quite heavily. I still think they're in a good list position, uh, but this is a 
concerning way to end the season. I'm, I'm less concerned about the final as I am the run of form right before that. Ultimately, they were in a top two position like midway through the year and they fell away and were lucky to make finals. So it is what it is. We'll get to some comments on Brisbane here, which I found interesting. Lit do says Brisbane can't play second halves, uh, 58 to 38. That was what they were outscored, I presume. Jack says, Lions season is over. And Gus Monfrey says, take away from the Lions and Blues. Has Brisbane seriously convinced themselves they are a genuine premiership threat? Yes, they had a brilliant first half against Carlton, a shocking second half, and once again, poor inaccuracy and crucial mistakes led to Carlton getting back in the game. Have they learned from their mistakes over the last month? Drop Hipwood too. GWS, on the other hand, led Swans by 27 at the SCG and almost beat them. GWS by 41 against the Lions. GWS Swans grand final. This is a harsh take, uh, and there's a few harsh takes on Brisbane here. My personal read is a little bit more similar to what Shadow Light said earlier. I think Brisbane cruised in the same way that they cruised against Essendon not that long ago, and the goal kicking is a little bit of a concern, absolutely. And I think they kicked 14 15 in this game, but. Probably some poor set shots, no doubt. But I wouldn't read too much into a team taking their foot off the pedal halfway through a final. Brisbane have to go the long way to play in a grand final this year. And they've got to travel twice. So if they beat GWS in Sydney, which is going to be a really tough ask. If they do that, they then have to beat Geelong at the MCG. And again, you know, while Geelong are not an MCG tenant, you know, I still think that stacks it in Geelong's favor. And Brisbane can be good at the MCG, but it's still not, you know, it's still foreign soil for them. My point being there is that I'm not really surprised that they didn't, you know, put the foot on the gas to accelerate to a percentage boosting win. It was irrelevant for them. This game was well and truly finished long before the final siren went. So I'm not going to read too much into that. And I think they are better than a 41 point loss to the Giants next week. That being said, that being said, I certainly would have never predicted Port Adelaide losing by 84 points in a home final. So we'll see what happens. I think I'm leaning towards the Giants, but that's more out of respect for the Giants, more than concern I'm having from the Lions from this game. But there we have it, guys. That was a really long football come down. Um, thank you everyone who's getting around the channel lately. I think we're very close to hitting 30,000 subscribers. So thank you so much for that. Um, I myself tried to make it not obvious, but I was kind of in and out of town last week. And uh, therefore I didn't stream any of the games and I only uploaded a few videos on the channel last week. So I'll be back at full capacity for the rest of the final series. No more leaving town. And uh, you're looking forward to getting stuck into the final series. This is uh, the best time of the year. Thank you very much for watching guys. I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.